This is Land of Havilah, Genesis 31. Last time Jacob got rich on his deal with Laban, but it was a fair deal. Now Jacob's going to make his exit. This chapter is history, but it's also an allegory of our escape from Satan. Father, please open our eyes to the scripture. Verse 1. Jacob heard Laban's son's words, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's. He's obtained all this wealth from that which was our father's. Jacob saw the expression on Laban's face, and behold, it was not toward him as before. Yahweh said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. Comment. Laban's sons claim, quote, Jacob's taken away all that was our father's, end quote. But Jacob took nothing from Laban. It was a fair deal. Six years ago, the deal seemed so good to Laban that he jumped on it. Jacob had nothing to do with the flocks that Laban's sons kept, so why haven't their flocks increased like Jacob's? Laban's getting resentful and jealous as well, as shown by the expression on his face in verse 2. Jacob's getting rich because God instructed him how to make the deal, and God was with him making all Jacob's strategies productive. Also, Jacob worked hard, as you'll say, coming up. The flocks have to be shepherded far and wide to find grass constantly, it's highly likely Jacob has been working a lot harder than Laban's sons, which is another reason his flocks are increasing so much more than theirs. Twenty years ago, when Jacob was running from Esau out of Canaan, during the dream about the latter, Yahweh said to him, I'll bring you again to this land, end quote, speaking of Canaan. Now in verse 3, God says, The time has come. Return to the land of your fathers. Verse 4, Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flock, and said to them, I see the expression on your father's face that it is not toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I've served your father with all my strength. Your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God didn't allow him to hurt me. If he said the speckled will be your wages, then all the flock bore speckled. If he said the streaked will be your wages, then all the flock bore streaked. Comment. Laban has no idea how to stick to his word, no desire to stick to it, and no intention of ever reforming. He's despicable and repulsive, reminiscent of Satan. Coming up, Jacob will recall how Yahweh instructed him to make the deal and how he could keep the newborns coming out the right color. Verse 9. Thus God has taken away your father's livestock and given them to me. During mating season, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the male goats which leaped on the flock were streaked, speckled, and grizzled. The angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. He said, Now lift up your eyes, and behold, all the male goats which leap on the flock are streaked, speckled, and grizzled, for I've seen all that Laban does to you. I'm the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you vowed a vow to me. Now arise, get out from this land, and return to the land of your birth. Comment. Now we find out how Jacob was inspired to make that deal with Laban six years ago. Besides hard work, his success came from a dream. The multicolored male goats leaping on the flocks were mating with the females in the dream. Jacob took this to mean that the offspring would be multicolored. So he made the deal he would take care of Laban's white flock in exchange for the multicolors produced by it. No matter how Laban kept changing the deal to put Jacob at a disadvantage, the Lord kept giving the advantage to Jacob, making the newborns whatever color Jacob could keep. Verse 14, Rachel and Leah answered him, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Aren't we considered as foreigners by him? For he sold us and has also used up our money. For all the riches which God has taken away from our father are ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do. Comment. Rachel and Leah figure they belong to Jacob. They have every reason to stay with him because God's favor is on him and not on their father. God made Jacob rich and their father has decreased. There's a parallel for us that it might seem at times that the riches and pleasures are in Satan's hands. But as time goes by, it becomes clear to us that our riches are in God and there's nothing in Satan's camp. His camp's completely barren of anything. Anything it seems he has to offer is an, an illusion. We shouldn't jump at his deal. It seems attractive, but it's the wrong deal. There's no future in Satan's camp. Everything belongs to the Lord. Yahweh said, quote, The world is mine and all that is in it, Psalm 50:12. What then does Satan have for us in the end? 
verse 17. Then Jacob rose up and set his sons and his wives on the camels, and he took away all his livestock and all his possessions which he had gathered, including the livestock which he had gained in Padan Aram, to go to Isaac his father to the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole the teraphim that were her father's. Jacob deceived Laban the Syrian in that he didn't tell him that he was running away. So he fled with all that he had. He rose up, passed over the river, and set his face toward the mountain of Gilead. Comment. In verse 19, Rachel stole the teraphim that were her father's. Teraphim are small portable idols. She stole two or more small idols. It was idolatry and theft from her father. Laban acknowledged Yahweh at times, but now we find out he worshipped idols also, and this is how Rachel and Leah grew up. According to Joshua 24.2, the family beyond the river served other gods, going all the way back to Abraham's father, Terah. The mixing of one religion with another is called syncretism, such as the mixing of Yahweh with idols. In verse 20, quote, Jacob, Jacob deceived Laban in that he didn't tell him he was running away, end quote. Verse 22, Laban was told on the third day that Jacob had fled. He took his relatives with him and pursued him seven days' journey. He overtook him in the mountain of Gilead. God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream of the night and said to him, Be careful that you don't speak to Jacob either good or bad. Comment. In verse 22, Jacob got a three-day head start. When Laban found out about it, he got his relatives together and set to the chase. But in verse 24, God restrained Laban by means of a dream. God restrains the forces of darkness, 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7. Verse 25, Laban caught up with Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountain, and Laban with his relatives encamped in the mountain of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you have deceived me and carried away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and deceive me and didn't tell me that I might have sent you away with mirth and with songs, with tambourine and with harp, and didn't allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters? Now have you done foolishly? It is in the power of my hand to hurt you. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Be careful that you don't speak to Jacob either good or bad. Now you want to be gone because you greatly longed for your father's house, but why have you stolen my gods? Comment. Laban knows from the dream that God's protecting Jacob and that God will not allow him to lay claim on anything that's legitimately Jacob's. So Laban's afraid right now to do anything dishonest or violent, but he's trying to find something legitimate he can use against Jacob. Thus Laban says, you stole from me, you stole my idols. As to why Jacob left without notice, verse 31, Jacob answered Laban, Because I was afraid, for I said, Lest you should take your daughters from me by force. Anyone you find your gods with shall not live. Before our relatives discern what is yours with me, and take it. For Jacob didn't know that Rachel had stolen them. Comment. Jacob thinks Laban's lying about his idols being stolen. Therefore he says, If there is a thief among us, that person shall die. Verse 33. Laban went into Jacob's tent, into Leah's tent, and into the tent of the two female servants, but he didn't find them. He went out of Leah's tent and entered into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the teraphim, put them in the camel's saddle, and sat on them. Laban felt around all the tent, but he didn't find them. She said to her father, Don't let my lord be angry that I can't rise up before you, for I'm having my period. He searched, but he didn't find the teraphim. Comment. Laban couldn't find his teraphim because Rachel hid them under the camel's saddle. She sat on the saddle and said she couldn't get up because she was on her period. This is a foreshadowing of our sin being covered by the blood, that Satan has no claim on us because he can't find anything with which to accuse us, all our sins covered by the blood. Ezekiel 18.4 says, quote, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. End quote. But there is an antidote because Psalm 32.1 says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Verse 36. Jacob was angry and argued with Laban. Jacob answered Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that you've hotly pursued me? Now that you've felt around in all my stuff, what have you found of all your household stuff? Set it here before my relatives and your relatives that they may judge between us two. Comment, quote, 
Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Romans 8.33 No one. It can't be done. No charge can be brought against the elect because our sins covered by the blood of Christ. Verse 38 These twenty years I have been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not cast their young, and I haven't eaten the rams of your flocks. That which was torn of animals I didn't bring to you. I bore its loss. Of my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. This was my situation. In the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I've been in your house. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters and six years for your flock, and you've changed my wages ten times. Comment. In the last chapter, when Jacob was making the deal that got him rich, he said, My righteousness will answer for me in the hereafter when you come. Now Laban's come, and Jacob's righteousness answered for him. Laban can't find anything in the camp that doesn't legitimately belong to Jacob. Laban's defeated. Jacob's prevailed with righteousness fair and square, and obtained his family and everything he has legitimately. There's nothing Laban can answer. This is all according to how Christ triumphed over Satan with righteousness, and wrestled a people away from Satan to himself by righteousness. Verse 42. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Laban answered Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. And what can I do today to these my daughters or to their children whom they've borne? Comment, lies, lies, none of those belong to Satan. Satan says we belong to him, but he's a liar. John 8, Satan's a liar and the father of lies. Speaking of Satan, Martin Luther said, one little word will fell him. That word is liar. Laban can't do anything because he can't find anything that belongs to him, he says, going on to verse 44. Now come, let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it be for a witness between me and you. Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. Jacob said to his relatives, Gather stones. They took stones and made a heap. They ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jagar Sahadutha, but Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and you today. Therefore it was named Galid. And Mizpah, for he said, Yahweh watch between me and you when we're absent one from another. Comment, Gilead means witness pile. This might have been the origination of the name Gilead, which would be the name of that region in the future. Verse 50. If you afflict my daughters, or if you take wives in addition to my daughters, no man is with us. Behold, God is witness between me and you. Laban said to Jacob, See this heap and see the pillar which I have set between me and you. May this heap be a witness and the pillar be a witness that I will not pass over this heap to you and that you will not pass over this heap and this pillar to me for harm. Comment, Laban agrees that he won't go past the heap to harm Jacob and his family. God's forced Laban to capitulate to let Jacob and his family pass over into the next country unharmed into a place where Laban can't go. This is a foreshadowing of God's people arriving in heaven where Satan has no access to them. Verse 53. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. Then Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Jacob offered a sacrifice in the mountain and called his relatives to eat bread. They ate bread and stayed all night in the mountain. Early in the morning Laban rose up and kissed his sons and his daughters and blessed them. Laban departed and returned to his place. Comment. There's been continuous foreshadowing of the gospel story in the past several chapters. To summarize, Isaac the father sent Jacob out from Canaan, telling him to go to a faraway country to his uncle Laban's house to get a wife. In the same way, God the father sent Christ out from heaven to a faraway country called earth to obtain a family for himself. In making the trip, Jacob crossed the Jordan River with nothing but a staff and the blessing of God. Christ came to earth with nothing but his own authority and God's blessing. Jacob won a family by righteousness. Christ won a family by righteousness. In obtaining the family, Jacob had to wrestle Laban the whole time, and he got them from Laban. Christ, in obtaining a family, had to wrestle Satan the whole time, and he acquired his family from the clutches of Satan. 
Jacob's now in the process of ushering his family back to Canaan, the home of his father and his own home. Christ will usher his family to heaven, the home of his father and his own home. In the journey, Jacob protected his family. On our journey, Christ protects us. Jacob's family was protected by the blood, and we're protected by the blood of Christ. What does all this mean? If we think it through, it means several things. Moses was inspired by God when he wrote this. God knew at the time of Moses what would happen in the life of Christ about 1,400 years later. God has a tremendous amount of foreknowledge. He has the power to span the centuries. He has a tremendous amount of creativity to write a double story, on the surface being the story of Jacob and underneath being the story of Christ. He has a tremendous amount of control over circumstances. If, he could, if, if God could inspire Moses to write accurately about the future, about the gospel story, he could also inspire Moses to write accurately about the past, such as about creation. In foreshadowing the gospel story, the gospel story is being authenticated, as well as it's being authenticated in the New Testament, it's being authenticated here in Genesis. Every signpost is pointing to the gospel story being true and pointing up the fact that God is God and that the Bible is reliable. But by far the most impressive foreshadowing yet to come when we get to Genesis chapter 37. But Genesis 32 is next, where the foreshadowing concerning Jacob and Christ will continue, which again will be at landofhavilah.net, Genesis 32.